Join me in prayer. Oh God, you are beyond our wildest imagining. When we speak of you, there are no words to describe your majesty and power. We know you best in Jesus of Nazareth, who shared your love with all he met. He called for our rebirth as your children, cleansed by water and the Spirit. We come together seeking renewal of the vows made at our baptism. We want to be faithful as Christ was faithful. We want to be fruitful in the work you give us to do. Bless our worship that we may be a blessing to others. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome. As always, it's great to be with God's people in God's house on the Lord's Day. And the invitation, of course, is to experience and enjoy God's presence together. And I invite you to be aware of some of the announcements that pertain to our faith community. Um, on the back, we have the um, the announcements, the Wednesday morning Bible discussion will be this Wednesday, but notice the time change. It will be at 10 o'clock instead of 10.30. So Bible discussion on Wednesday morning, 10 o'clock instead of 10.30. And um, I believe the ladies' Bible study will be beginning again in June, um, as I understand. Um, quite possibly beginning again in June. We will see when June gets here. Um, let's experience and enjoy God's presence together. Let's spend a moment in silence as we prepare to continue our worship. to God glory and strength. Worship God in holy splendor. The voice of God is powerful and full of majesty. God offers strength and peace to all people. God's voice thunders over the waters. God's strength empowers our response. Holy, holy, holy is the God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with God's glory. The universe is God's dwelling place. There is no place where God is not. <clears throat> Yeah. 
prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament went to the temple to pray. It was during a time of grieving for him. And while he was in the temple, he had a vision of God's majesty that moved him to recognize his unworthiness and his sin. Sometimes we think we have nothing to confess until we are confronted by the awesomeness, the presence of God, the creator of all things. In this sense of awesomeness, we come to seek forgiveness from God and reconciliation. Join me, if you would, in the prayer of confession. God of all worlds, we confess that we are too often people of the flesh. We sometimes live in slavery to our possessions and are bound by our fears. We are so attached to our own corner of the world that we find it difficult to identify with people who experience far different from our own. We do not want to suffer with the hurting, the hungry, or the oppressed. We turn away from the suffering of Jesus to pursue temporary advantages. We sometimes we find ourselves acting like <coughs> another human organization, not the body of Christ, making a difference in the world. Oh God, forgive us and reclaim us as your children. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> God always claims us and loves us. When we confess our lostness and seek new birth in the spirit, putting to death our selfish pursuits, we can receive what God always offers, participation in God's realm. We are born anew to life, which partakes of eternity. The cleansing coals of forgiveness touch our lips, taking away our guilt and blotting out our sin. Receive this gift from God because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven, and we have right relationship with God and eternal life. <laughs> And eternal Lord, we thank you for the Bible, our sacred book, and we thank you for what it means to us and how from the Bible we can, we can receive guidance and hope and, and strength. We ask God that you will help us to understand what is read to us today, help us to be able to apply it to our own lives. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. The first reading is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And this is the reading that talks about Isaiah's call to ministry. Now it starts out with the phrase, the year that King Uzziah died. King Uzziah was the king of Judah for about 52 years, I think. And the last 11 years of those were kind of a co-kingship with his son, Jotham. 
Uzziah died around 739 or 740, and it was about this time that Isaiah received his call to ministry. So when we think in terms of what the scripture is saying, we think in those terms, historically. The reading also talks about a seraph. Seraphs were in attendance in the presence of God. A seraph was a celestial or heavenly being, and it's seen not only in the Old Testament, but it's seen in the other Abrahamic religions, Judaism and Islam, as well as Christianity. The belief in seraphs originated in Judaism. So a seraph was kind of like an angel who was in attendance before God, and they had several wings, and they would fly in God's presence and constantly cry out, holy, holy is God. So they were the sense of God's holiness, God's presence. Occasionally you hear the word seraph. Sometimes you hear the word seraphim. The definition of seraphim is simply more than one seraph. In the Hebrew language, plural is the addition of I am. So seraph is one seraph or seraphim is simply more than one. So with this in mind about the about the history and the time frame surrounding this reading, I ask I invite you to listen to or listen for the word of the Lord from the book of Isaiah. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their face. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. One called out to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, hey, woe is me, I'm lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, because this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin has been blotted out. Then, then I heard the voice of the Lord say, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, Lord, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Oh 
Testament reading is from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8. And the book of Romans, the letter of the Romans, was written to an established church, and it was written so that they might understand what is the theology of the New Testament. You see, Paul did not found the church in Rome. It was founded by somebody else. And because of that, Paul found it necessary to write to them to make sure they had everything in order. So the book of Romans, or the letter of the Romans to the churches, is very often seen as or referred to an exposition of the theology of the New Testament. Whereas other letters are written to address a specific problem going on in the church. The book of Romans was written to address the problem that the people there needed to know what was indeed the theology of the New Testament. And that's why it's written. St. Paul also very often creates a dichotomy between those who are of the flesh and those who are of the spirit. And I think that's what's happening in this reading as well. We have the flesh, we have the spirit, and we are encouraged to live according to one and not the other. We are encouraged to live according to the spirit. So I invite you to listen for the word of the Lord from the second reading, Romans chapter 8, 
verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to, to the flesh to, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God, for we have not received a spirit of slavery to, uh, to fall back again into fear. We have received the spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we have suffered with him so that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. reading today is from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 3. And this is a pretty common reading. I'm sure most of us have heard this reading before. I think it's important to understand a couple of things as we go into this reading. First of all, the definition of rabbi in the New Testament. A rabbi was a person who had a certain level of respect and a certain level of training, and because of that, would gather disciples and would give them the same training so that they themselves might become teachers as well. The definition of rabbi is simply a teacher who has studied and prepared and earned the title. It isn't as though anyone could say, hey, I'm a rabbi. They had to go out and earn that position. 
and they would gather disciples. Usually, disciples would choose their own rabbi. <coughs> Jesus, on the other hand, although he was trained as a rabbi, had the same training, had the same respect as a rabbi. After all, we see Jesus standing up in the synagogue during worship services and doing readings because he was recognized. Rabbi, would you do the readings this morning? Yes, I will. And he would come forward and give the reading. <coughs> Jesus was not only recognized as a rabbi by the common people, he was recognized as a rabbi by other rabbis, by Pharisees and teachers of the law. And the story <coughs> that we read this morning from the Gospel of St. John is one of these times. Also, in this reading, uh, there's a reference to a situation that happened in the Old Testament. Uh, do you remember when we talked a few weeks ago about the story of Moses leading the people out of Egypt, and they were on this extremely long trip through the wilderness, and at one point, the people started complaining against God, and for some reason there were a lot of serpents that were crawling around and they were poisonous and they would bite people and then God told Moses to build a bronze or brass serpent and put it on a pole and hold it up and whenever someone was bitten by one of those serpents all they had to do was look up at that bronze or brass serpent on the pole that Moses had made and they would not die. Well, that story is being referenced in this reading from St. John this morning. So I invite you to listen for the word of the Lord from the gospel reading, John chapter three, verses one through 17. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher sent from God, for no one could do the signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus said to him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said, How can one be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus said to him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What's born of flesh is flesh. What is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it wills, and we hear the sound of it, but we do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher in Israel 
and you do not know these things? We speak what we know and testify to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I tell you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the whole world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I find these readings absolutely fascinating. I think they're great and wonderful readings, and it's, I think it's very pleasant, very enjoyable just to read them and hear about them. I'd like to talk for a few minutes about a couple of things that are in these readings. Today is Trinity Sunday, as you know. Trinity Sunday is always the Sunday following Pentecost. Last Sunday was Pentecost. This Sunday is Trinity Sunday. And it's the time in which we acknowledge and talk about the Trinity. Now, I will contend that it's possible to believe in Jesus without believing in the Trinity. And early in our nation's founding, there were several churches that were founded that were Unitarian as opposed to Trinitarian. And some of the early theological and academic institutions that were very Christian were Unitarian institutions. Harvard University, established in 1636, I believe, a long time ago, it was and is a Unitarian university. And Harvard Divinity School falls in that realm. Now, the idea of the Trinity is an idea that's expressed in the New Testament. It's not a phrase that's used in the New Testament. And I believe the idea comes from the belief that we as Christians have that Jesus is God, but if Jesus was God, who was Jesus talking to when he said, God help me? We also believe that the Spirit of God fills us. Well, who was Jesus talking about when he said, when I leave, the Spirit of God will come in my place? So we have Jesus talking to God and talking about the Spirit, and all three are God. So it's that reasoning that brings Christians to believe in the notion of the Trinity. It doesn't say or use the word Trinity, but Christians believe in the Trinity based on these references. Now, I'd like for us to look briefly at Isaiah's experience, the experience that St. Paul suggests that we have, and some of the words of Jesus 
in the reading from the Gospels. Now in Isaiah's experience, the presence of God made him humble and it also energized him for service. It was Isaiah's call to ministry, as it were. Now, what we know is that in the Old Testament, several of the prophets became prophets against their own will. Jeremiah didn't want to be a prophet. He had to. Jonah did not want to be a prophet. He went kicking and screaming. He also got what? Isaiah, however, became a prophet because he wanted to. So there's a difference. Sometimes we fulfill God's will for our lives simply because it's a call. Other times we fulfill God's will for our lives because it's a desire. I really want to. I would rather see us take the latter rather than the former. And I would use the latter as a stronger indication of God's call than I would the former. I would suggest that the former, going into the call of God kicking and screaming, is far less, far less popular than going into our calling because it's what we want to do. In the reading from Isaiah, he said he heard the voice of God, who will go for us, and he said, here am I, pick me, I'll do it. He wanted to go into his ministry, his prophetic ministry. But that was preceded by a sense of humility. And I honestly believe that being in God's presence makes us feel humble. Now, in the gospel reading, and let's offset one against the other, the writer says that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Now, I don't believe that, that Isaiah felt condemned I believe he simply became aware of who God was and who he is. I don't believe that humility and self-condemnation are the same. I believe that humility is simply an acknowledgement of who we are, equal to, no better than, no worse than, everyone else around us. And in the presence of God, fully aware that God is God and we are not. Isaiah felt that and experienced that. The sense of oneness with all of humility and all other people in the presence of God. So it's not as though there's a caste system. I'm better than you, you're better than them, they are better than someone else. Not as though the Presbyterians are better than the Lutherans who are better than the Episcopal. It's not like that at all. On the contrary, we are all the same. We are all equally called. And that's the definition of humility. And being in God's presence allows that to happen. Now, not only was Isaiah fully aware of who he was in God's presence, but the presence of God energized Isaiah for his call. It was, I know who I am now in your presence, God, but yet I feel energized to fulfill God's call. And I feel a desire to do what God has called me to do. You know, I do not believe that we are ever in a position where we no longer have a call or the ability to do the ministry that we are called to do. You see, in the gospel, Jesus makes reference to Moses lifting up the serpent. The gospel reading makes reference to Moses. Do you know how old Moses was when he started his ministry? 
Moses was 80 years old when he started his ministry, when he began. There's a special on television about Moses and the people of Israel. Have you ever, has anybody seen that one? Moses and the people of Israel? I think it's on Netflix. I was watching that, and as I was watching it, I was thinking, my goodness, Moses looks really, really good for a guy that's 80 years old. You see, in order to tell the story, they picked a younger guy. <laughs> but, but the reality is that Moses was 80 when he started, and he was 120 when he finally said, okay, I'm done. God's call for us is permanent. When God calls, God empowers. Now, if you say, I really don't want to do it, I have no desire to do it, I will buy that. That's valid. I'm okay with that. If you say, I'm too old to have any value to the kingdom of God, I will not buy that. That's not scriptural. And that's not what we see in the Bible. If you feel the desire, if you feel the tug, if you hear in your own mind God saying to you, who will go? Who will do it? I need somebody. And if there's something inside of you that says, yeah, I'd like for it to be me, consider that God's call to you. And God wouldn't call you if God has no desire to qualify you. And also understand that ministry isn't always talking. Ministry isn't always singing. Ministry takes many different forms. And there are many people who are part of the commonwealth of God. And whatever form that takes, based on your desire, your ability, if it's your desire, if it's your ability, feel free to respond and to do. I think I'm going to leave it at that today. And I would invite you to be part of our Bible discussion. And, and during that time, we'll go further into, we'll spend an hour going a little bit further into these readings and talk, talking about them further. So people of God, today is Trinity Sunday. Acknowledge and enjoy Trinity Sunday. Understand who we are in God's presence, knowing that in God's presence we are all equal. Understand that in God's presence we know that God is greater than us. Also know that God calls people to do God's work. If you would like to, feel free to respond to God's call to you, whatever form that might take. Let's pray. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the privilege you've given us to be your people. Help us, God, to hear your call, and help us to, by our own desire, respond to your call. We thank you, God, for your grace to us. We pray this in your name. Amen.
to join me in the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. together in prayer and we know that there are several people in our community who are either personally hurting or have experienced recent loss so let's remember them in prayer we also know that uh, one of our Walnut Village community uh, Jean Boyle died relatively recently and we're aware of that and Jean was is a devout Catholic. He would be here for every Catholic communion we had. He would be here for Mass when we had Mass. Sometimes Gene would be here a half hour early, waiting for the service to start. He was dedicated to his faith. Let's remember his family in prayer as they negotiate and navigate what they need to do following his death. And if you have concerns or things on your mind that you would like to have as part of this prayer, I invite you to be thinking about them as we pray. And in so doing, make those things part of our prayer together. So let's pray. Gracious and eternal Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for calling us to be your people. We ask, God, that you'll help us to acknowledge you in all our ways. Help us, God, to respond to your call to us. If, God, we have no calling, if we've already done it, and, and that's okay, let us not feel guilty for, for not having a call at this point in our lives, knowing that we fulfilled it sometime in the past. But at the same time, God, if you are calling us to another call, we ask that you'll help us to respond. Empower us and give us the desire to follow. Give us the strength to do what we've been called to do so that we might glorify you and benefit others in the commonwealth of God. We pray, God, for the family of Jean Boyle. We pray that you will give them strength and give them wisdom as they navigate what they need to do now during this time of loss. We pray for others in our faith community and in our Walnut Village community who have recently experienced loss. We ask that you will give them comfort and give them strength. Those who are among us today, God, we pray that any who are hurting, we ask that you will give them healing. Help them to experience your healing, your wholeness. We pray, God, for those among us who need your wisdom and your guidance that you will be present for them in that realm we pray for our community that you will give our leaders wisdom to do what's best for the entire community that we might live in joy and in peace 
and enjoy our relationship with one another and our relationship with you, God. We thank you, God, for calling us to be your people. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.